Okay, Adrian, thank you very much for joining me. Nice to meet you. Um, I think for before we get going, before we fire away, I think maybe if you were to introduce yourself, your any titles or anything you have, and let the people know who I'm talking to. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, right. So I'm uh, Adrian Thomas. I'm professor of biomechanics at Oxford University. Uh, I uh, run a, um, a spin out from Oxford University called Animal Dynamics. We do bio inspired robots, vehicles, systems. Um, and I'm, uh, I think I'm, I got to know Wes because I'm another paraglider pilot. So mm -hmm. I, I've been involved in paraglider design for till. Oh, since 1999, terrifyingly long wow. time, designed a whole bunch of paragliders, and I've been a competition pilot for three years with the British team and with some of the other people that you've interviewed, Russ Ogden and yeah. several others, um, Jockey uh, Sanderson, and um, I won the national championships on the paragliders four times uh, on wings that I've been involved in design with. The first one I won had an aerofoil I'd stolen from an albatross in it. So it was based around some, so it's combining fun of uh, the work I do in the Oxford Animal Flight Group with um, with the, the fun I have at the paragliding. And then outside of that, I fly microlights and um, sail and yeah, anything that is entertaining. And this afternoon I'll be off thumping up a hill on a bike. So, so diverse and eclectic uh, array of talents then mate yeah <laughs> i um i often get referred to as a uh, as a reset as a renaissance man um myself <laughs> by friends and stuff and i'd say that you are very much one in the same you've got very and and also a lot of your interests seem to be reflective of mine as well yeah i've been looking at what you're up to and i can't say i'm much into the the, the mixed martial arts stuff but jumping off bridges that I've had the, the base jumping thing looks like fantastic fun I know I get completely addicted so I've got to steer, like, steer clear of that and I steer clear of motorbikes because I get too excited by yeah. things like that and base, I kill. base jumping <laughs> definitely I avoided it for a while and then I managed to get dragged in but I say to people if you can live the rest of your life never base jumping my uh, my advice is don't base jump basically it's uh once you start it's very hard to stop and the the you know the dangers never change it never gets any safer it's never any different so i do say to people if you can avoid it stop um <laughs> but um, you the, um the flying squirrel thing yeah, yeah i have yeah i've done a few um i've done a fair few out of a plane um in a wingsuit and then I've done a couple of base from high, high, what would be high altitude base, not like really low proximity stuff. And the only reason I stopped was back a couple of years ago, I lost seven friends in a year. And I said, I use the term friends loosely, seven acquaintances um, in a year. And I thought, well, some of these guys are the best in the world and they're dying. I'm yeah. by no means close to being the best in the world. The only way you get to be the best in the world is to keep pushing and if it's happening to these guys, and how who am I to assume that it wouldn't happen to me? You know, so I decided to to step away from it. I don't I don't need the extra exhilaration in my life, so I decided yeah. to step away from the proximity base. Really. Yeah, yeah, makes complete sense. Yeah. So, um, but so, uh, professor of biomechanics at Oxford University. Um, <laughs> I mean that that title in is in itself is an. Uh, at dinner, that must be one of the best things to introduce yourself as. I mean, when I introduce myself, I'm to make myself look a professional MMA fighter, but I'd much rather be professor of biomechanics at Oxford University. <laughs> how um, <laughs> how did um, how does it? Uh, what what I'm intrigued to know is, did uh, did the interest in flight? come before the interest in say uh, biomechanics of science or was it science led to an interest in flight no it was always flight first it was yeah. always so i was always making model airplanes and kites and flying things around when i was a kid yeah. and yeah but I, I mean i always had always had pet animals as well so i was always you know keeping keeping various animals and some of them would fly and uh, so it was, it was finding a way 
when I was when I was at university, I was looking for a job that would allow me to do what I wanted to do. And, mm-hmm. uh, well, there are there are lots of options, and it's just a case of you know picking the one that lets you do what you want to do. The, the yeah. downside is I haven't found one yet that lets you do what you want to do and makes you loads of money. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, likewise. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, being being an academic um, definitely allowed me to to. You can't, it's kind of like running your own small business. So you you set up a research group and you you bring in PhD students and postdocs who do do research in your and you do that by demonstrating you're really good at the research, getting research grants. You write proposals and get grants. And then you can just do whatever it is you want to do. So it's up to you to set your you have control over your own life to a large extent. That was really what it was all about for me. It was being able to control it so I could you know if, it, if it's a Beautiful sunny day, like it was, you know, like it was yesterday or the day before. Um, I could go off, go off flying or go off sailing or whatever it is I wanted to do at that that time. That was that was what it was all about for me was finding a job where you have control. Most paraglider pilots, it's either to seek a job that allows that, or they're always cursing their job because it doesn't. It becomes what I mean. Once you've tasted flight and that that a Da Vinci quote of once you've tasted flight, you'll always look to the sky and stuff. Um, so I, I think lots of people have got you know that's their dream. But once you become I don't know a chef or a builder or you're you're confounded by the parameters of work. But something like yourself would become the acad- academic and pursue the avenue you that you have is was simply because it allows me to. Allows you, sorry, to do the things you wanted to do. No, it was, um, that was that was coming when I when I finished my undergraduate degree. I I had a choice of going off for a, I had a place to go and be in North Sea to dive. I used to do a lot of diving. Yeah. There's a diving instructor at the time. I had a place to go and be in North, you know, training for a North Sea diver or a PhD. And then when I finished my PhD, I had a place, an offer of a job to go off for further research and a job. With um, as a paragliding instructor, and there's kind of these little splits where it went one way or the other, and uh, and just happened to go the way I've you know you, you could easily have gone completely different. <laughs> like it, you know, life could have been completely different, yeah. but all of those options, were, all of those things I was doing were to give me time to do the thing I really wanted to do, as well as. And it, I, no, but the one thing, the one thing about it, I think, is if you're actually, you know, if I had become a paragliding instructor, then you're sort of trapped into that's all you can do, and, it, yeah. and I don't know if it's right. I don't think it's as good if you're working to do. If I, your work is your hobby, it's. I agree, and also what you probably find is a lot of paragliding instructors that I know say they lose the best days because they're the days to instruct people how to paraglide. Okay. So, I mean, you, I, I've got friends who are obviously paragliding instructors now and comp pilots, and they're very rarely are they out doing cross-country XC unless they're in a competition. And, you know, look, one of my favourite parts of, of paragliding, although I love comp flying, is the fact that when it's a cross-country day, the adventure, that, okay, everyone's getting together, we're heading somewhere, we're going to go and fly, that adventure side of it, that freedom is, is paramount for me. So to lose that freedom to the sport, which you want the freedom for seems very counterintuitive. Uh, so, like you say, there, I think uh, I would be very much the same if I was offered the the same role. Yeah, although the, although having to be out on a hill every day, um, <laughs> there are worse things to have to do, aren't there? Definitely, definitely. I do, yeah. feel, I do feel for them at the moment, though, you know, because um, you know, I'm on furlough at the moment from from a company because the R and D side, the research side, we can't really do it right now. So I'm I'm in the furlough scheme. Mm-hmm. Uh, I look at uh, I'm I'm also on the um, exec committee for BHPA, and BHPA has been looking at what's going on with all the paragliding instructors. Of course, they've got no business. There's nothing they can do, and it's, it's I feel yeah. for them right now. It's just so painful for. For all the paragliding schools, I think it's going to be really hard for them to come back again. You know, when we do get let out, yeah, hopefully summer. Yeah, I feel very sorry for them. Well, I understand their pain at the moment. They must be. It must be really hell to be right now to be a TI or something doing. You know. Definitely. I mean, I I can't imagine I, because you can't fly, which is the one thing you want to do when you're at work, and you can't work because your work involves flying. So you're you're doubly. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, people say to me, "How are you managing?" But it's 
for me, I, I, I hate that I can't paraglide. I hate that I can't go fishing, but I have this. I love to do this. This has allowed me to do a lot more of this. I have writing, etc. But if you if your life revolves around the outdoors, it's very yeah. much, you know, a, a big a big thing also. When's it going to reopen for them? They don't paragliding instruction doesn't seem to fit under any like given bracket. So at least if you were say a gym owner or a restaurant owner or you work in this industry, the government are addressing your industry with paragliding yeah. coaching. You're you're like an, a forgotten leisure that nobody seems to to contemplate. Yeah, it must be really hard. The one thing is that everybody's going to really appreciate the outdoors a bit more when we do get this out. I think. Everybody's been looking at it and thinking, God, I want to be out there. And normally, we don't, we don't get that. You know, that precious hour, Boris Johnson's hour, we can go outside and exercise. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the amount of people who um I've seen running, and the amount of people who I've seen in seen uh enjoying the outdoors in comparison to who don't usually has been quite shocking. I mean, on my evening run, I might generally see five, six people. Now it's, you know, you're passing 30, 40 people. I like, I'd like to think that, um, the, the health benefits of this have gone up dramatically, but whether they will have afterwards, I'm not sure this will continue this phase of exercise. I think it's going to go, it's going to split. It's going to be two kinds of people. There's ones who come out, fitter and there's one who's just sat down eating chocolate and ice cream because it's so <laughs> depressing being locked in and I completely understand that yeah. and I've, I've decided to go the fitter route so I've been thumping up the local hills on my bike <laughs> <laughs> I, I've taken into a, I've taken a bit of mountain biking in but um, yeah. mate my ass oh it's absolute <laughs> and people my friends like padded shorts I've got padded shorts on but I can ride one day can't ride the next could maybe ride the next day i'm just waiting for it to to settle down and get better i must be somebody said you have to use a saddle or something i don't know yeah that's where i'm getting it wrong um so where does we'll go back to these other animal side of things for you growing up and stuff now obviously i'm a falconer i've been a falconer for 24 four or five years something like that um and you're obviously a falconer now is this an uh, an early thing that was that came from you so you were interested in early on or is it something that was because of your interest in your your job uh so no like, well i was interested in falconry for for years but never really had a chance to you know, i mean, uh, read the goshawk and all those classic books yeah. about all those classic things, um, but then I I, um, I lived in Bristol and did a research assistantship at Bristol University where I was working on birds and bats flying, and I'd have the I'd train all these animals to fly up and down the corridors in the in the zoology department there. And, you know, late at night they'd shut the corridors and I'd go and fly up and down. And I had had uh, all sorts of things. People used to bring in rescue birds, rescue animals, and I'd, I'd look after them, and then they'd do flight experiments. And so I had, um, I started off with cockatiels, which I trained to do the falconry thing of coming when you call them, they'd come, and they'd, I mean, usually they'd come and sit on your shoulder, but they'd come to the fist as well for a sunflower seed. For the, <laughs> it's not like having a chip, you know, dead chip. Yeah. Or and then um, we were doing a silent flight, study of silent flight in owls. So I had a tawny owl, um, which I raised from, from a, a chick captive bred thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a uh, little owl that was a rescue bird that had been hit by a car and didn't have half of its lower beak. And a bunch of other things, swifts and things, that we um, flattened down the corridors. And um, studying the aerodynamics so looking at with the owls it's really interesting because they they really are stupidly quiet and the tawny owl yeah. used to live in the um, used to live in the in in the flight lab just loose flying around be roosting up in the corner and he you'd be writing you know I'd be sat there writing with a pencil and it makes a scritching noise and all of a sudden it would come flying past your ear and you wouldn't hear it until it grabbed the pencil and gone off to wow. come up with it in the corner um, I remember one time down in the corridor getting ready for an experiment to a sat in the I'm not sure I understand. Oh, sorry, Siri's always listening. <laughs> always listening. 
<laughs> yeah, one time I was I, I had um, cardboard down the floor because I was using helium filled soap bubbles to trace the air movements that the wings make, you know, as you do. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. Yeah, cloud <laughs> bubbles, bird flies through, wingtip vortices, you can see all the flows. It's absolutely mm-hmm. spectacular, beautiful stuff. And the bird just really started looking at this cardboard on the floor. I thought, what the hell is that? Picked it up. And there was a spider underneath it, and it had heard the spider. Wow. And immediately I picked it up. It went down and grabbed it and ate it. It was kind of like you could see it pulling the legs off yeah. like spaghetti. How incredible um, is can, that? Yeah, it can hear spiders. How that's, the hell does that? And that's just that is incredible. I mean, obviously, I I know that owls have um, a disproportionately better hearing than a lot of other birds, and yeah. you know their their ears are offset and their, the shape of their face is conical so that they can absorb the sound. I yeah. know all these elements, but then to see something. Uh, not because it wasn't even a, a scientific experiment you're you're conducting another experiment and you see something like that so to see that action through nothing but pure nature that's how its natural instinct is that must have been amazing i'd be I, that's great though. yeah i'd been yeah. thinking about that for weeks and weeks Just the, the spider under the cardboard that's crazy yeah you never forget a thing like that but yeah but literally i lifted it up big big, big sheet of cardboard kind of i don't know it was a Flattened box, lifted up, and in the middle underneath was one of those big hairy, <laughs> big hairy spider. It was a big spider, but still it had heard it, and yeah. it was it was really obvious. The moment I lifted it, it was down there. That was it, eaten. But it, yeah, it was good fun. That owl, he had, um, he would. I kept him just loose in my in my living room for a while, but he made too much of a mess. So yeah. he had to get into, uh, into the office, into the lab, and he's, he still lived loose there. And I could put sheets. They're they're very habitual. They yeah. go where they go. Um, and he was yeah, he used to fly around. And um, I do remember once the professor of aerospace um, came came for a visit, and he landed on his shoulder, which he thought was great until he shat right down his back. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in yeah. I've been in trouble for birds in the house and shit shitting in places before. Yeah, I've had that. I felt that wrath myself. Um, yeah, you ever had a gossip? Oh yeah, so I have uh, uh six goshawks. I think I've trained um from parent reared and then imprint. And now most of the goshawks that I've done have been imprint from so, there. Famous for being able to shit in any direction for about three feet, including upwards, aren't they? <laughs> well, yeah, they are, but you should have a big female golden eagle in your kitchen. Yeah, and when yeah. a golden eagle slices up your kitchen, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, regularly two metres, three metres long and thick, chalky white. Oh, it's one of those it's one of those slices that you have to put the bird away to be able to clear up. You can't do it with one hand and a piece of kitchen roll, you know? Yeah, the, the only one I can rival that with is that we had fruit bats for a while. And yeah. if you think about how fruit bats hang, they've got to do something, otherwise they're going to make a mess yeah, of themselves. Of course, yeah. So, and I've never realised what they do, but what they do is they're, they're hanging upside down with their feet on the thing, they reach up with their arms, and they swing, and then they let fly as they're swinging, as they go swinging right through. And so they just, and because they eat fruit, they've got diarrhea, so they yeah. just spray a straight line all the way. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Not one hundred percent. I will be going on YouTube looking up fruit bats pooing after this podcast. This is the only podcast I will have finished and gone away to watch uh, animals defecating. Hundred percent. I will be. Um, they were they were fantastic animals to keep. You know, fantastic to interact with. Apart from that one major problem. With yeah. Them. What are they like for uh, for working with? Because I've often. Like bats have intrigued me as a as a pet, let's say, uh, because they're so I think they're so cool, they're so interesting. What are they like to keep and interact with? So mostly, so the so well, all all of the British British bats are you, know, you need a license to yeah, handle them. Yeah. So so the, the ones I've got had been rescued by the local RSPCA um, when people had done things like spraying the loft with with insecticide and they'd found bats in the loft and we'd um, keep them, feed them up until they were fit and then let them go go again, which apparently was what we were allowed to do at the time. Yeah. Um, the fruit bats were from um, Bristol Zoo, actually, they lent oh, yeah. them to us. Um, fruit bats are super intelligent, really, really intelligent, very interactive, very, you could train, all the bats you could train to fly and they used to exercise them in the lecture theatres in the, in the zoology department on Woodlands Road. 
and they'd fly around and then you could call them back in and they'd come and land. Um, the fruit bats, I mean, it's a bit, feels a bit weird calling them back in for a banana, you know, <laughs> they, they'd come for a, they would come. Um, but they are, they stink and they're really messy. All of the bats, they really stink. They, they, they do a lot of um, um, scent marking. And yeah, yeah, they're not like, you know, most of the birds, even even all the birds are prey, I mean, they, none of them really smell, but the bats, God, they, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I feel, I feel like bats are going to be getting a really bad press now, and uh, they're going to be off people's favourite animal list, I should imagine, <laughs> but, um, which I think I mean, is a shame. Imagine how many mosquitoes we'd have if we didn't have all the bats around. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. What they do is they clean the mosquitoes out of the air. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you only got when I'm fishing, uh, and it just gets like twilight, and you see them all just the zipping just past your ear to take all the gnats from around your head, and just zipping just past the rod tip. And you're like, how are you? How are you flying so fast and missing missing my fishing line? You know. Yeah, we did a we did a bit of, bit of work. I was helping Gareth Jones, who's a professor at um, zoology in Bristol at the moment, on Dorbenton's bat, which is a fishing bat. And it, it flies down, it puts its feet down and trails them through the water to catch, to catch oh, yeah. flies. We get up on, um, up on the, uh, the Mendips, some of the lakes up there. That must have been, so we were strobe picturing them. So we had a, a strobe flash gun yeah. in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the dark, you know, and there's bats are flying past and the strobe would go off and you get this trace of them coming down. And we were trying to figure out how they detect fish underwater. So basically... Um, you don't do anything normally. You don't use any normal equipment. You don't have anything that's... you So far, you do helium-filled bubbles and now strobe photographing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does sound the most amazing job in the world. It's not good fun, isn't it? When you try to see things that you can't normally see, so you've got to use clever techniques to, to yeah. figure out what's going on. It's, um, yeah. Well, it's all, most of that is sort of slow motion trying to trying to slow down how the animal moves to reconstruct exactly why it ha- the, the clever things they're doing to achieve the end. So those, those, those bats are skim- skimming the surface with their, you know, they come down, they fly in ground effect really close to the ground, skim the surface with their claws, and as soon as they hit the fish, they poik it, gaff it out of the water, really, just like wow. traditional gaffing. And, how big are these bats? <laughs> they're only tiny. They're only... Uh, same size, a bit bigger than the pipistrels that we, you know, will have been the ones that were fishing the midges out from around your head. So yeah. a little bit bigger than those, but not, not much. There are some big ones in um, Southeast Asia, some sort of proper, you know, decent, chunky-sized ones that also fish. Ghost bats and fishing bats. Um, and, but even when bats are all small, really, compared to the birds, mainly because... If you look at studies of, of what birds eat, almost all the birds are recorded as eating bats. And even blue tits are recorded as eating pipistrelle bats. Oh, yeah? See, the same size, really. But yeah. then if you look in, in the sort of Bible for bird watches, which is Birds of the Western Palearctic, it records records of blue tits digging around under tiles and pulling bats out. And so That's incredible. Bats are out there, and bats are hiding from... The reason bats fly at night is to hide from birds. Because otherwise they get eaten. <laughs> That's incredible. I never even, I never even considered that you know something like a, a a tit or something would consider eating a bat. And then of course you've got the larger up the species of birds. Because I yeah. I would only have assumed um, that it would be something like raptors or maybe corvids that would maybe consider that. But it's yeah. surprising how many. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a good look at, I did a study on, on evolution of bird wing designs, and we had a good look at, we were trying to see whether there's an effective diet on wing shape. So you'd think, you know, you'd, you'd think that how birds catch their prey would, would have an effect on their wing shape. Actually, there's no detectable effect. I mean, this thing about peregrines having pointed wings and hawks having rounded wings because the hawks are maneuvering and the peregrines are doing the fasting yeah. actually doesn't work. No, there's no evidence for it. Doesn't mean it's not happening, but there's there's yeah. no there's no evidence. For it. But to do that, we looked at the diet of virtually everything we could, and it's amazing how many things eat bats. It's really weird. It's just yeah. I mean, they, I guess in the daytime they're just a bit you know lethargic and not really <laughs> yeah with coat really. So it's <laughs> really fascinating if you go to if you go to islands where there are bats but no birds, the bats will fly during the daytime. 
And if you go up into Scandinavia, where the birds where the birds tend to only arrive you know, later in the year, and the bats tend to live all year round, before the birds arrive after the migration, the bats feed earlier in the afternoon before it's really dark, and then when the birds arrive, they get later and later and later. That's amazing. I just thought through evolution, bats were just nocturnal, but I guess it's a, a, a predatory thing as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, but birds are dinosaurs. And when, yeah. we, when we were all little mammals hiding, we'd be hiding in the night time while the dinosaurs were out, and bats are still in that world, poor cool things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and back in the dinosaur days, the flying dinosaurs would have been the most terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There were those uh, the big... Um, uh, big... Uh, as star kids, they call them, big, the big pterodactyl relatives, yeah. the pterosaurs. Some of them are as big as giraffes. What? Well, two of them. There's, there's one found in Germany, um, and it's called um, oh, Hatskitopteryx. <laughs> of course it is. Um, and they found they found the wing, this boat, the wing, the arm boat, the wing, yeah. and I think this one, and it, and it's um, if it was stood up, you know, they stand like that. Yeah, uh, its head would have been at about four meters from the ground. Wow! They've got neck bones that are about a meter and a half long. There's ridiculous animals. Four hundred kilos, they reckon. Wow! It's and hard th- to tell how. You know, you can't tell how much lung and air sac there would have been in that. But you know, the the yeah. biggest the biggest bird is a thing called um, Argentavis. It was like yeah. a condor, very like a condor, but from South uh, South America, from about. Um, uh, 10 million years ago or so they've got really good you know, they've got the skull and they've got this bone. is that it's is it like a, a hoss eagle or something ha, like, ha, uh, yeah oh. hoss eagles the, the it's like the, that was a, the new zealand it's like a, a red tail hawk yeah and that one they've got uh, the maoris had tail feathers from that bird yeah it's extinct so recently like 1600 is about when it went extinct they've still got tail feathers from that bird in some of the headdresses that's unbelievable. That would have been a 10, 12 kilo eagle. Wow, well, imagine. Yeah, can you imagine what that would I mean, be? As someone, as someone who's felt the wrath of my own female at about four kilos, yeah. um, I, sometimes I've, over, I've, I've overstepped the mark and flown her a bit late into breeding season. And so they can get really, like, really wind up and you get a couple of slips and they miss get frustrated and then you you really feel the wrath and there's no air breach when it hits the glove or anything you know so when you feel the power and speed of something like that to to think of a bird that large 12 kilos doesn't even bear thinking about it's not i mean other people are going to be out there they said well yeah wes i know what you mean but i've only ever flown an african gray parrot but uh, easily my female eagle could take me off my feet at full speed, if at unawares, so the Hass eagle, it's a twelve kilos. That's, it doesn't even bear thinking. That would definitely predate on human beings. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So there's there's definitely so there are a couple of records of eagles taking taking people, but usually children. But yeah. it's only a couple, really, really dubious. But yeah, that thing would have been would have had no problem at all really the Romans used to train eagles the martial eagles and yeah. were, were trained for warfare and they would have been terrified can you imagine it just <laughs> I mean uh, the amount of people who were terrified of, of my eagles just like some people get like yeah I'll hold your eagle I'm like Are you sure like yeah I'll hold it and they come round and I get the glove I'm like go on then and they're like uh, it's so much yeah. bigger and so you know when it's looking at you with those predatory eyes and it's yeah, there's no, I, I'm, when, if, they're sat, if they're sat in the fist and they're looking down at you. Yeah. That's the, and you think, yeah. My, and my Joe Falcon we used to have uh, years ago, Martin Cray used to look after mm-hmm. that one. And it got pissed off with him once and it just went. And uh, oh, yeah. he ended up in hospital having his ears stitched back. Yeah. Don't get bit by a Joe Falcon. No, Definitely. Just went straight through. Yeah. He was all right. The nurses invited him to a party after. It's quite a good story. I think he was. I think he. Yeah, he had quite a good story to tell them, and I think he quite enjoyed himself. <laughs> he's like that. Mark Martin's been on the podcast a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like Martin. He's an interesting guy. When he talks about his old television uh, lifestyle and stuff, his camera work. He's an interesting guy. He's got some really cool stories. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So that's where. Uh, so from early on, it was flight was what intrigued you. So when you started, 
when you started into your career with science and stuff, you knew it was going to be to pursue uh, looking into flight. And has that has that evolved now more? The more you've uh, stuck with your academic career, as the avenues or where you've taken it evolved more, or are you still following the same sort of trajectory of what you wanted to study? I I, I think I might be wrong, and correct me if I am. I think your main interest is um, the the ability trying to make flight uh trying to to make that mechanical trying to trying to replicate flight is yeah. that would that be um it's more gen it's got more general so so about uh when was it probably in the middle of the last decade so probably about 2003 2004 um i realized that the you know i was doing lots of work with birds carrying instruments and carrying um you know, black box inertial measurement units so we could work out how they were flying, what the accelerations were, mm -hmm. what the wingbeat frequency was and things. And I realized that the electronics and the instruments had all got small enough that we could start powering our own. And for years I made model ornithopters um, just for fun, yeah. as you do. Um, you may have to and... stop a second and explain that word. Now, I think that is, that for me, I think if I'm right, it's a... a it, it replicates flight in order to, to be able to fly. Yeah, the thing that flies by flapping. Yeah. The flap wings. Yeah. yeah. You can buy those little pigeons, you wind the tail up and they flap their way yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those kinds of things. Um, and I realised that electronic, you know, there was a, you know, when I started off um, doing model aircraft, um, it was all gas powered because electric motors were, were rubbish and they, the story is, you know, the thing people used to say is that electric motor aircraft climb because of the curvature of the Earth. They can't actually. And then um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, suddenly that completely changed. Now you can get you know, easily 1,000 watts per kilo out of, the, out of an electric motor. I mean, much, much more power. Out of them. Well, you can see with the Tesla's currently there. Yeah, of course, yeah. Fastest accelerating cows, they're all electric. And, um, and it became obvious that there was enough power in the electric motors to do stuff. And I got interested in what you could make, and it, but it took a long time before I got in a position where I could um, actually kick off doing robotic um, vehicles and systems. But I'm, I'm actually interested in, so, so for, for about 10 years I was working on how animals fly and how they walk and swim to work out the mechanisms that they use that we could then build robots to do the same thing. So can we build a swimming robot or a walking robot or, or a flying one? And because I've done most of my research has been in flight, that's the one that I went after first because it's where I know more about what's going on. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested. I, you, know, you, look at, you look at the animal world out there and animals are able to do stuff that we just can't remotely do. So, yeah. so if you look at, I don't know, you look at, look at, insects flying and um, you get a stormy day and the insects are still just doing what they do. They don't, they're not bothered by it. They're yeah. still, the bumblebees are feeding at the flowers and the dragonflies are catching the, the midges. The midges are still flying around. While it, when it's so stormy that the aircraft will all be landed. And I went to a, um, uh, many years ago, I went to Farnborough Air Show and they had the, um, this, it was so long ago that the tornado must have been fairly new. So we're introducing the tornado all-weather fighter, and then they cancelled it because the weather was too bad. <laughs> and there were crows just cruising up and down the air, airfield, not bothered at all, not flapping because there was nice soaring lift. And I thought, you know, why? You know, what, what is it about the way the animals fly that means that they can keep going? And obviously, they have to because otherwise they don't eat. Yeah. But, you know, they keep going when million pound aircraft are grounded and um and it's the same for walking and for you know that if you drive an off-road car eventually you'll find a, a hill that you can't get over you'll find a rut you can't get through but yeah. a walking animal you know they you can get over anything yeah exactly yeah well, yeah if you watched i was flying in um flying a paraglider in, in uh, where the hell was that? That was in uh, south of south of Annecy in France, and there were um, chevre 
you know, the, the mounting goat things. Yeah. Basically running down, as we flew past, they, they saw us and they just took off and they ran straight down yeah. this vertical cliff. Bloody hell. And I watched and they ran down it and they ran off and, and they looked up as if nothing had happened. And, you know, if I, if I was rock climbing, that would have been, that would have been, you know, an extreme grade of climb. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been a very severe or anything. It'd be much higher than that. And and they ran down. And they haven't got. They haven't got clingy. They've got hooves. Hooves. Yeah. yeah exactly. They got the same sort of hooves that a deer's got, or similar to like a cow or something walking around a field. That's the yeah. sort of the, the things that they're working with. You, and you they're. Put a car at that and it'll tumble. You know, yeah. It wouldn't have a wouldn't have a hope in hell. So. Mm. Yeah, the animals are much better at coping with the real world that we see than, than any of our engineered systems are. Mm-hmm. Unless it comes to massive sizes or extreme speeds, and then we're better. So, yeah. you know, there aren't any airliners flying around at the moment, which is which is kind of lovely. Yeah. But but they are much better at flying you know, 3,000 miles transporting a huge amount of cargo than anything the animals can do. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and freighter ships, you know, and trains really efficiently carry stuff, carry huge amounts of stuff long distances. But they're all limited by the, by the conditions they can operate in. So train, train is a really good example. You have to put down tracks and you know we we have to put down tarmac to let road to let roads work and let cars fit. So we yeah. we have to really modify the world dramatically in order to get stuff to to work on, which is great, but it's, it's fantastically expensive. And the animals manage to deal with all that without having to put any of that. And they deal with the world as it is. They just they themselves are modified to be able to cope with it. And that, you know, what, what occurred to me at that point was, you know, we've now got the motors that are, that are powerful enough, the batteries have got enough storage in them, and we can make small enough mechanisms that we can start to make robots that do what the animals are actually doing. So that's that's really why I started the company. Although, you know, I only started the company when I found somebody who understands business that I could work with. Because <laughs> You know, I can add up or I can make equations work, but, you know, if I try to balance my bank balance, that just doesn't Yeah, work. so you understand that you're losing money, you just don't know how. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do I stop that? Yeah, I'm just, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah so it's, it's, it's the simple things of, it's the boring stuff, basically. I can't do the boring yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm... I can't see the and see, that's not me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm, uh, I'm sort of similar in that, like, with this podcast... I'll go away and I'll build a platform and I'll, I'll get to get the platform to look right. I'm pulling my hair out. Things are going wrong. It's not quite how I want it. But 25 minutes to fill out a tax return could take me 10 days because I just can't be bothered. I'll procrastinate. I've got no interest in it. So the mundane, boring stuff, as long as it's around something that I like, I'm okay. As soon as you put anything up and people are like, you could easily do this. I'm like, there's no desire. I don't want to be good at that thing. I don't want to be good at accounts. Yeah, what's the reward for me? For yeah, that? Exactly. Best in the distant future. Yeah, exactly. Um, so your company, um, your company is uh, Animal Dynamics. Um, yeah. Let's venture a little bit into this now, and you've touched on that. Your your the plan is to make robotic or replicate um, animal movement and stuff with robotics. So yeah. where are we looking at um, your plans of what you're developing? Obviously, I know I've been on the website and stuff, and uh, but what what what's your plans? What are you developing? What are you currently working on? And what would be you know how are they going to be implemented? So um, we started off. Uh, we started the company because um, I've been I've been working with I've been getting funding out of the US Air Force. The US Air Force has an overseas um, science research division. And I've been getting funding out of them then to look at um, well, a whole b- variety of things, but most the most fun one was looking at peregrine attack strategies. And, and they wanted to see whether peregrines had something clever that they were doing to get their success, the success rate they achieved, um, that they could then implement in missiles. <laughs> wow. So, so they paid us to go and study peregrine attacks. Well, how, how great is that? That's amazing. So, Absolutely amazing. So high-speed cameras, filming peregrines with GPS on their backs, and 
uh, chasing, um, a lot of this work I did with Martin Cray actually, so we train the peregrines to chase after model aircraft which are towing a chick on a string. Mm -hmm. uh, the model aircraft pilot was, said, was told, right, anything you can to avoid being caught by that peregrine, you do it, and you go and fly aerobatics and the peregrine would always catch the chicks yeah. and completely destroy them. And, um, and sometimes they'd catch the aeroplane as well. And we did have one particular peregrine who liked to take them apart. So you'd find us polystyrene confetti <laughs> afterwards. She'd even go around crimping all the wires and stuff. <laughs> she would scream. Um, so the US Air Force gave us the money to do that. And after about 10 years of them giving us you know, a, a decent chunk of money every year, about 100 grand a year um, to do that, uh, the UK noticed that something was going on and probably probably it was worth them getting involved. And uh, the UK's research arm for the MOD is, is um, DSTL, Defence Science Technology Labs, who support basic research, so early stage stuff, blue skies stuff. Um, and they, they came and asked whether we could um, design a really tiny... Um, uh, flapping winged drone. They wanted something really small that they could fly around that would be able to do surveillance work. And this was during Afghanistan where a really major problem was people would have to, you know, the soldiers were asked to go into compounds, but to go into a compound you have to basically push open the door and stick your head in and if there's somebody, if there are bad guys in there it's not a good place to yeah. be. So what they wanted was something they could just fly up and look over, give them a camera view and come back down again. They'd know, know whether there was somebody on the other side of the wall or not. And lots of lives have been saved by little tiny drones like that, by yeah. people not having to stick their nose where they don't want to. And DSTL asked whether we could make one. The problem with helicopter ones is they get knocked about by the wind. Yeah. And Afghanistan is a windy place. And so they, they keep losing them. They're really expensive. Um, so they said, could you make one that flies in a strong wind and can cope with a strong wind by flapping? And we said, well, I don't know how much money you're going to give us. <laughs> they said, about half as much as you want, we're going to have to do it twice as quick. So it's always been a little battle with them not giving us quite enough money to get it done and wanting it yeah. yesterday. Um, but we, took, we, we did that and we built up the company really around um, building... Dragonfly drones, so so dragonfly inspired drones. Bit, they have to be a bit bigger than a real dragonfly because they've got to carry a camera and a radio link. Yeah. Which is uh, the initial the initial ask. They they said, can you build it? You know, thirty grams. I said, yeah, well, we probably can do that. And they said, we need you to carry an eighteen gram data link. I said, well, no. <laughs> no, no, we're not gonna. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna be smaller than the data link and carry a data link. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we built um, we built Skeeter, which is our dragonfly based drone, mm -hmm. um, which is flying beautifully up at our um, base up near the Cowley Mini Works, um, and it's we've been able to fly it outdoors in strong winds, and it does it does cope with the strong winds much better than any of the rotary ones. So so mm -hmm. we can quite happily just hold station like Kestrel does, just pointing into wind, mm -hmm. looking at something in 15 knots of wind without any worries. So at all why, things. why is that? Why is it, why, how come the replicating the movement of dragonfly wings is much better than using propellers, let's say, or the, the normal style of drone? Well, there's two, there's, there's two real reasons. The first one is on a propeller, you're, you're spinning it. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a helicopter and you're flying, if I'm flying towards the camera, this blade's going forwards, this one's coming back, so they've got a tilt. So, so, so ultimately there's a, there's a control, you, you've got to put a roll in that way, this one's going forwards, so it's getting more lift, so it's trying to turn you that way, and ultimately you just get limited. So they, helicopters have a limited top speed, mm -hmm. inherently. Um, and it's the same if you've got a quadcopter, it's just, it's, it's balanced out, but the backwards going blade gets less lift than the forwards going one. It's too much and it, it limits your control. That's one. Um, but the main one is if you're flapping, you've got nothing, lots, nothing, lots. So you're turning the lift on and off all the time already. So you're already modulating how, how the lift is working. So you just change that modulation. It gives you fantastic bandwidth, really fast response times. So we, we get response times that are 
uh, faster than the wing beat frequency. So if it's flapping 50 times a second, we might get you know a hundred a hundredth of a second response time. Wow. Like that. So really, really quick. So how, in comparison to a um, so an insect wing beat, what say I don't know how it's measured, like you know our RPM, however you measure it. So a wing with an insect wing beat, how how what comparison would your robotic dragonfly wing beat be speed wise? So if you to so give a mosquito that that really annoying noise, that's yeah. eight hundred hertz or thereabouts, eight hundred yeah. times a second. <laughs> wow, um, which is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you look at a bumblebee, a big, a, a normal worker bumblebee will be 200 beats a second, and a big queen, well, that's, well, that's really low. That will be about 120 beats a second. If you watch a dragonfly, it'll be typically about 20 beats a second. Yeah. We're flapping our drone. It's a bit bigger than a dragonfly, but we've got decent chunky motors on it, so we're flapping it at higher frequency than the real dragonflies go at. So. It's a, 50, 25, I keep asking for 50 hertz and they keep giving me 25 and it comes, <laughs> we split the difference somewhere in the middle and um, uh, the more, yeah, the faster it, the faster it flaps the, the harder it's working the lower it's endurance but the more it's gust tolerance, so there's a trade off there's a trade space of, you know, am I going to be maybe more gust tolerant or fly for longer or yeah. if you're more gust tolerant you're also more stable so you get a better image so it's, um, but obviously it's, it's, Back yeah. battery size, you're really limited because you're you're trying to keep yeah. something really minimal. So yeah, the trade off is finding that happy medium. But at the same time, if you only need this thing for popping up, having a quick look, a couple of minutes use, I guess. Not, I mean, that's me being that's me being someone who's been punched in the head a lot. That's not me. You've hit the nail on the head, and actually, the, the military are trying to figure out exactly how how they want to use this at the moment. And, and until COVID hit. They were doing trials with with these sorts of vehicles, trying to figure out exactly what is the right way to use them. They, they're so new, they don't even know what the best way. To use. One of the interesting ones is um, in oh, I can't remember which in, in one of the recent conflicts. They one of the things they they made most use of them to do was to fly ahead of tanks, so they could see whether there was anybody with an anti-tank uh, um, bazooka sitting yeah. there. Because wow. if, you if your tank sticks his nose out, well, it's too late then. But if yeah, one exactly. of these goes in, it's, and it's, an awful, you know, they, it's an awful lot cheaper <laughs> and there's nobody involved. I mean, the, main, the main thing we like about these robotic things for the military is you're not putting people in harm's way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah I'm quite happy if they blow up pieces of electronics for me. Yeah, <laughs> because, because you get to make more of superb. Yeah, so what it comes down to is how much the these military investors are willing to spend on um, uh, pre preserving life yeah. over... Yeah, so, oh, uh, well, we can if we only think about saving 100 lives, let's give you 100 grand. You're like, well, that's not really the way we should quantify this. Let's try and save all the lives and put whatever we need at it. They talk about qualities, don't they, with the COVID things, how many yeah. quality of life years can you actually set oh, yeah. the, yeah. the calculations are just terrific yeah. really yeah I mean you know, if you can save one life with one of these things then, then delighted really. and, yeah, yeah so, definitely yeah, we started off with those with the with the Skeeter Dragonfly drones and then then half you know I think two years into that program they put out a call for um, a last mile resupply vehicle yeah. um, where they were expecting people to use big quadcopters to carry um, payload from Soldiers to soldiers in contact with the enemy. So the idea is you've got a kind of the the quartermaster's brought stuff up and he wants to shift it the last I don't know half a mile or a mile. And at the moment they do that with a um, with a quad bike with a guy on a quad bike. And those keys are the hottest property. But nobody wants to hold those keys. They <laughs> you sat on a quad bike and you're sat there driving around and you're a target. Of you're course. A target. So, yeah. And they wanted to do that automated to avoid the quad bike guys getting in trouble. And for that one, we said, well, they said it's going to be it's going to be quadcopters, and we said, no, probably not really, because they they're not very good at carrying a payload. Mm -hmm. how, how about we do this with the paragliders? And that seems to work. And that that's what we're most focused on now is is 
autonomous powered paradigms. So this is the um, this is probably your project that I know most about. A because it's within the realm of what I uh, like. Also because I'm really good friends with Alex. So yeah, yeah. I've spoken to Alex about it a few times, and um, he's obviously yeah, told me that he's be responsible for that one. He led that project. From, yeah. From scratch, and we hired him actually. Uh, we hired him before we got the contract, so he arrived. I, I I applied for the contract to do that project, and then Alex arrived to work with us to work on something completely different. And I said, "Oh, by the way, we've got this contract which involves working on paradigms. How do you feel about getting involved in that?" You can imagine the beaming smile. We got yeah. Back from- <laughs> yeah, someone who loves that, someone who definitely just loves to fly. So, uh, yeah. and for someone who hates missing days, good good days flying for work. Now, when you're actually getting to fly at work or experiment within the realms, yeah, he seemed chuffed when he talked about. It, but he's he has been every time we've been out over the last couple of years. Of course, we get like a little update on how things are going, and we yeah. talk about the project and stuff. And it just sounds like absolutely amazing. So this was the one that I knew the most about. And for for the people who were um listening uh it's like a paraglider like a paramotor trike sort of thing replication of a paramotor trike but without a person yeah that's it yeah without a person um initially radio control so you know fly it just like a normal radio control anything um and then with a um, an autopilot in it so you program in gps waypoints and it flies around your waypoints and yeah goes and does deliveries and we've done We've done uh, military exercises on Salisbury Plain and in the States with them where they said, you know, take off here, fly somewhere over there. And they usually give us the shittiest takeoffs (laughs) and the worst possible landing sites, go and deliver some stuff. Um, And and the big advantage is that um, the thing that Alex has built, um, and he ran that project, the thing that Alex has built is robust as hell and just works. So, you, so they'll say, we're going to give you a window sometime today. How long will it take you to be ready? And you say, well, 10 minutes. And then we're ready to go. Yeah. And the other guys are like, well, it'll take us two hours to program it, four hours to put it together. <laughs> and can, yeah. um, and uh, we, the nice thing about them is that is also that um, when you launch one of these big quadcopters, so there's the, the other people who are in this situation, are, there's a beautiful company, really good guys actually, called Malloy Hover Bikes. Which is a ride you know, in one one iteration of it. It's a ride on quadcopter. You can sit there and pilot. Oh, I've seen them. Yeah, I've seen them on YouTube. Yeah. 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 But the noise is unbelievable. Yeah. And you know they were giving us a five kilometer run. So you take off five kilometers away, fly in, drop your payload, fly back again. And the moment they started it up, we were sat at the drop zone. You could hear the moment they started the engines up. Even though you couldn't see it, it was over the horizon. You could hear it coming. So it's never going to be, you know, in, yeah. in a real situation, you're just shouting, here I am, there's a flag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whereas with ours, we can glide. Yeah. And you know what it's like with a gliding paradigm. It's not fast, but it's, you know, it doesn't make any noise. You only, yeah. need to be, yeah, you only need to be fast if you're evading something, I guess. So if you're, if you're silent, if you're, not dete- if you're not detected, there's no point being fast. Like, I mean, there's... I've got a friend, um, a special forces friend, and a lot of the stuff that he does is close, close contact stuff. So his main role is quiet, be dead silent. You know, he's not, he's not an in and out guy. He's my stuff's quite. He was the first person to tell me about this. He told me about a dragonfly drone about probably about five years ago. He said like, there's this. He said, where's this drone that we've been trialing? He said in Afghan, and I was like, no way. He said, no. He said like, it's a little tiny one, but he was saying that. He said the next stage that they were working on were flying it somewhere and it would land, it would charge itself off of an electrical output. So rather than having to be plugged in. And I was like, no, you're talking Jack Reacher stuff. But then, of course, it started to come into, into fruition. And so with this thing that you've developed, um, so, like being quiet and being able to glide is much more effective than being really fast, but everyone knowing you're there. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So you, you know, what would you do? Well... You want, to, you want to fly into somewhere 20 kilometers away that's 10k behind the enemy lines. Well, you just climb to 3,000 meters and glide it. Yeah. And, and you're totally silent for the whole 10k. You're never going to know. It's, you know when, it, when you do paragliding competitions or cross countries, so you land. But with a comp, competition, when I go out to paragliding competitions, um, I have a tendency to go out front and, and land early because. <laughs> 
pushing too hard. Yeah. If you land and you look up and you go, oh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, there's, there's 10 people up there, so I'm doing all right. And then you finally get there and there's 50 people ahead of you. Yeah. Because they can't, although paragliders are big and bright colours and stuff, you just don't, you don't see them. You really don't see yeah, them. Yeah, definitely. No, so, so it's, yeah, it works quite well for that. But yeah, so the, the main, main reason for that, I think that's not the main reason the military guys like it. I think they like it because it's robust. Yeah. And easy, you know, you can you can bolt it together. I mean, you can bolt it together without having to know anything about it. Although we did find with when we we let some of the special forces guys play with one, they did manage to put the propeller on backwards. <laughs> So we've had to make it so you can only put it on the right way around. It still flew, it just the performance wasn't very good. It yeah. Had to its mission altitude. But, um, so, yeah, we had to make it pokey oak so you can only put stuff on the right way around. There's only one way it can be connected. But then it's robust as hell. And we had another occasion where they decided to take it off. Well, here's, here's a site. Yeah, we'll just take off between the cars. And they managed to run it straight into one of the cars, which dented the front wing of the car and bent some of the antennas and they phoned us up and over Skype, Alex was able to get them to put it back together again, involving duct tape, and flew again within an hour. So, you know, they like that, that it's mendable, it's not fragile in any way, and, yeah. and it's cheap. Yeah, and, and the payload, what sort of payload will it carry? Uh, well, we're building them at, they scale, you know, so we're building them at a variety of sizes. So the ones we've been, the ones we've mostly focused on, because you, if you're less than 20 kilos total takeoff weight, then, then there's no certification. The certification is relatively easy. Okay. So we've been focusing on those for development. They carry you know, 5 kilos or 10 kilos swap battery and payload. Yeah. Um, but we're building one that carries 120 kilos at the moment. Wow. We've test flown one version of it. and um, that comes originally from a, a call from the Australian Army who wanted to be able to evacuate wounded soldiers. And I said, well, one of your soldiers weighs 120 kilos. <laughs> big guys, the Australian Army. Big guy. <laughs> I think they have all the kit as well. But yeah, so, um, so we're, building, we're building them bigger. We, we've got a plan eventually to build one that will carry two tons. There's wow. not really a scale limit on this. So the biggest thing I know of that's been dropped on a ram air parachute like a is eighty thousand pounds. So 40, 40 tons is the biggest thing I know of that's been done. So was that dropped? Out, yeah, out the back of a plane. I was going to say yeah. So that was like a, a vehicle or something dropped out of the back of a plane and then just. Yeah, but that, exactly. But to, no. to <laughs> but to differentiate, that's in a ram air parachute, not a normal round parachute. So that's no, the. No. Uh, yeah. yeah, that that's the big difference. You know, it's the uh, yeah. aerodynamics and stuff that goes into a ram air parachute as opposed to something just falling and landing where it needs. Where, wherever it lands. Yeah, so yeah. paraglider is just a very efficient ram air parachute. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, so you, you, there's not a scale limit, so you can make them as big as you like. So, so the obvious, the obvious end end goal that the um, uh, the SF guys always ask for, and and the Americans have just put out a, a, a request for information about it, is um, could you could you make one that flies a car? Well, of course you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course yeah, I'm gonna need a bit more of that money though. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit cash limit, but oh, it's enough money. We can fly. I keep saying, look, you give us enough money, we'll fly a main battle tank for you. <laughs> wow. But you know that would be a big one. That would be a yeah. that would be a big a big wing yeah. with a long takeoff run and a big big chunk of motor on the back of it. But yeah. but actually, that amount of weight has been flown on one of these on a ram air chute. There's no there's no technical limit. Yeah. So basically, once you've got the working, once you've got the working model, scaling it, then I guess is is rather easy. Especially, I mean, without uh, without obviously uh, being trying to cause any offence or anything like that. Quite, uh, paragliders and these sort of things are quite rudimentary. They're quite basic. They're quite simple. All you need to then is figure out. Okay, we need to now make the bit underneath it work because we know exactly how that is going to fly. We need to work all these other bits. So you're working with something that's quite a basic design, and you understand really well, obviously. Yeah, it's not here. You pull the right string to turn right. Yeah, <laughs> the exactly. Left to turn right, both to slow down. Yeah. And so long as you don't do it too much, you're alright. But the nice thing is that the bigger, as they get bigger, paragliders get more efficient. There's more. 
there's more wing per line and yeah. there's there's less drag on the there's less you know, the air gets relatively thinner there's a there's a reynolds number thing so there's less mm. drag and and the most obvious one is the stability gets better so the, the small paragliders are really vicious and yeah there's a reason why paraglider world champions are almost always huge and it's you know it's it's because big wings are just are just better yeah <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That's always a, co a constant uh, back and forth within paragliding is the, the advantage that you get from being at least a, a medium to large pilot as opposed to being a small pilot. Because this is why a lot of women suffer as well, because primarily women are smaller individuals, so they're flying the smaller wings, which generally don't perform as well. Yeah, I have to I carry 10 kilos to get into a size M and, uh, you yeah, know, it's, yeah, it is painful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it, I mean, it's, but for us, for the for the um, stalk project, for the for our delivery vehicles, it's a real bonus because it means that if we can sort all the problems out on the small ones, so they're reliable and they already are, then the bigger ones are just going to be easier, and it's just yeah. going to be logistic. It's just going to be you know, can we get a big enough space to lay it out and take it off and, and off you go, and can we get a big enough motor that that has a high enough power to weight ratio. Yeah. to get the takeoff done. Once you've got the takeoff done, then everything else on it is really is surprisingly easy. Um, so, yeah, it's a really exciting project, partly because you know, the end result is not military applications with this one. The end result with this one is, is um, humanitarian disaster relief. Um, but more, you know, so, so flying in food to places yeah. that need food when the roads are out. But more importantly, uh, logistics in places where where there are bad road, um, where where the infrastructure doesn't exist at the moment. Because, and, and the reason I, the real reason I like that is because the thing that's an ecological disaster everywhere is where you put in massive in infrastructures. So long as you put, as soon as you put the roads in, people go in and harvest the wildlife, and poaching yeah. happens, and everything. If you just leave it as it is then there's no access for people and it's only going to be the people who really understand the place who will go in there and they don't usually over exploit things the mm -hmm. natives don't you know it, the amazon native peoples have lived there for thousands of years without over exploiting the place as soon as westerners get in there we're doomed well yeah the, the, the every big deforestation site there's a road leading to it that's exactly yeah exactly so if we can provide logistics so people can get their goods in and out without having to put the roads in, well, wouldn't that be fantastic? It'd yes, be a, true. You know, so, you know, I don't know, we, we get a lot, of, um, a lot of produce comes out of Nairobi and comes to us, you know, sugar snap peas or flowers or, or whatever. And you know, if we could get that shipped by, by stalk paramotor delivery system rather than putting in a, a, a road, yeah. network that'd be absolutely fantastic and it's better for yeah you know, and it's a it's a win-win for everybody there because because you know, they they want to be able to ship their produce from place to place and at the moment they've got to drive you know 12 hours on bumpy dirt tracks well wouldn't it be better to fly four hours on a on a straight line um, yeah exactly and primarily you the you can afford to pay them more because your expenditure from fuel etc isn't as much so yeah, it makes a lot of sense from a humanitarian point of view. Um, it sounds like an awesome project, and it's good that. So, like, it's it's nice to hear that you're thinking along those lines instead of thinking because the money would be commercial. That would be the money. Make it as commercial as possible, and who cares about the impact it has? Let's make this really commercial. Get everyone using it, and then. But you're not. You're thinking this can work for humanitarian reasons, which is obviously a reflection of who you are. It could make a real difference, and, it, and the the reason it could make a difference is because if we, it's because the way we've we've designed these things that we've designed them to keep the cost down. So if you do the comparison, we've been doing estimates of what it would actually cost to do transport in Africa with these things, yeah. and and the smaller ones, the cost becomes about comparable to a guy on a moped, which is oh. what we use at the moment. So delivery, yeah, kind of. Uh, operation and the, and the bigger one the 120 kilo vehicle can carry what you could normally put stick in the boot of a land cruiser so it can and the cost is about comparable you probably do four trips the land cruiser will do one but it'll take a yeah. quarter of the time yeah and you don't have a person so you save on that cost of the person being in there. 
Yeah. I guess as yeah. well, somewhere like Nairobi or somewhere, uh, yeah. just because you mentioned it, just because I, I imagine the airspace isn't so much of an issue as well. Um, but then yeah. are you going to be flying at an altitude where the airspace is a problem? But also, I don't expect there's... Because it's not as industrial and, and built up, I guess it's not a problem anyway. So you can literally fly straight line of sight, place to place. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which, makes a, which will make a huge yeah. difference to you. Yeah, all these countries have their own particular air, airspace regulations, but you know they're all they're all quite. If there's an economic advantage for them, they're quite amenable to making it all it all work by uh, um, appropriate means. But yeah, I mean, the, the whole point would be to make it commercially desirable for them to put it in place. Yeah, yeah it's just make it you know, a win-win. It's like um, you know they haven't bothered putting in um, telephone wires through most of Africa. Because mobile phones are much cheaper and more effective, yeah. so let's have mobile phones. And it's much more sensible, isn't it? Just... Yeah. So that is paid off to be slightly third world for them because they're, like, yeah, we were they're they're looking at us and laughing at the expenditure we've had for yeah. hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So have you, have you had any um interest or have you been approached of anything to do with like Amazon uh, drone deliveries or anything? Do you know anything about that and where that's heading? Um. I. Yeah, I've had I've had a little bit of contact with them, um, and I've had a little bit of contact with um, a couple of called Skyports, who are putting in drone delivery centres in the middles of in the middle of cities all over the place. Um, Amazon, in particular, when we talk to them, they're very much about being able to drop it to an individual house in the middle of a built-up area, and that that isn't going to suit us. Yeah, that's not, that's not really what we want to do. Um, we're much more interested in doing stuff where you've got a fairly open area for for both um, takeoff and delivery, and you're not so worried about precise. I, I don't really want to be dropping stuff into the middle of cities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But this, but that is something that Amazon are are closer and closer to doing. Is it from someone who knows? Like, it's really close to that actually happening. Yeah. So they are doing. They are doing stuff. Yeah. Um, as in they are delivering stuff they're, at the moment they're delivering COVID medicines to COVID patients to avoid um, people you know to keep the, the distancing going on is it commercially viable well I no yeah. <laughs> absolutely no chance at all so they do I, I think with Amazon and with Alphabet and the Google one um, most of that is about advertising at the moment okay. and that's working <laughs> yeah, that's definitely working. I just uh, because obviously it's a big threat for paragliding and air sports and stuff in the UK because they're gonna do massive grabs of airspace. Um, so it's a big threat for us, and it's something that obviously I've seen it, and it looks amazing, and you want to encourage it, but at the same time you don't because you realise that these are multi-billion pound companies who don't need to to cut corners to make money, and other people suffer immensely people with their leisure time and people like myself, a paraglider pilot yourself. So it's not something that I really want to encourage, but I love the technolo like technological advances of it all. Yeah, yes. I think it needs to be very carefully organised. So I know with the, um, the Skyports guys, um, they have been buying up sites that are near to places you could put a corridor in where the drones could operate and not disturb the airspace. So you know, he bought up sites along the Thames in London so you can fly the drones along the Thames and then not, not muck up the airspace. Oh, wow. And you'd fly them in lower than they... At the moment, they fly helicopters along that route and you'd fly them in lower so they don't interfere with the helicopters. Um, I think it just... There needs to be coordination on these things. So it's not... So it's perfectly possible for us as you know, even when we're doing a low save we're usually you know, two three four hundred feet yeah and if we're any lower than that then we're landing aren't we yeah and, and then it's an emergency and you can land anywhere um because it's an emergency whereas the drones you know for operating these these things and at the moment they're all talking about operating below 400 feet in defined corridors which i think is probably okay apart from if it becomes really popular, then the noise of quadcopters going past is going to be really, really annoying. They do make that whirring kind of horrible, <laughs> yeah. particularly annoying noise. But yeah, I don't know. So there is discussion of that here because um, there's a 
there's a 5G and drone operation testing center at Cranfield University, um, which is, Cranfield is also an airfield. Um, and then that has been extended towards Milton Keynes, and they're talking about extending that further again to Oxford Airport and then down to Southampton in one direction and across to, uh, I think it was Norwich in the other direction. So kind of oh. linking up the East Coast ports and the South Coast ports with a drone delivery corridor. And I looked at that and I thought, well, if that were on the straight, that basically cuts off all the paragliding cross-country routes that go down. It, cut, it does what Farnborough Airspace Grab has done, but sort of squared. Yeah. So it's much worse than that. So I don't know, it needs to be, we need to be, as paraglider pilots, looking at the airspace, we need to be quite vigilant about what's going on with these with these places with these new technologies yeah i mean they're, um, they're constantly putting in new ways of monitoring who's where and it may be that it all goes down to something like the flam system or the adsb transponders that you can carry now and just transmitting that you're here and the drones it's going to be like the police uh, police cars are supposed to keep clear of everybody else the drones would have to keep clear of everybody else including the paradigms um, if they put that in, then we might it might still be workable. The trouble is, you've got commercial versus versus. I, yeah, exactly, and we all know as unfortunate as it is, we still live in a time where the brown envelope is king. Yeah. So if. That never happens, does it? <laughs> Um, so you know if you've got the multi-billion pound industry that wants to invest money into it versus me and my four mates from Avon saying please don't do this we're gonna lose you know it's that's inevitably we're gonna lose so yeah it's, it's one to keep our eye on it's one that a lot of the unfortunately a lot of the general public don't realize are happening and they don't realize the consequences of it so you try and get your friends who aren't paraglider pilots or microlight pilots or any of these sort of you try and get them involved and they, it goes over their head a little bit they're like well you don't that's no there's not even a hill there you're like that's not how so you end up losing like you become completely like disjointed and you're back to just being your your ex members who are just or just paraglider pilots so yeah it is a shame um i think it needs a big rethink i think they really need to rethink and i, I suspect that it wouldn't surprise me if COVID has an effect on this, because you know, imagine what it's like to live in um, West London at the moment, when there are no aeroplanes going into yeah. Heathrow. It must be such a relief, and then yeah. it's going to be such a shock when it kicks back in. Yeah, I um, think. I wonder uh, if there'll be a kind of yeah, a rethink yeah. of how it all works. Yeah, I, I've been thinking the same myself. Is uh, uh, it, we're either going to boom and everything goes back to normal, people will in six weeks' time, people will have completely forgotten what's happened you've forgotten the time off they've had and the world's just gone back to normal and it would have been like the six weeks holidays when kids are off school or will it be um a scenario where people have got have had this now and they're reluctant to let things go back to how they were so it's a it's a strange one because this is so unprecedented it's a strange one you know i don't know not sure where we're going to be heading next for this um but, yeah, I mean, it's an opportunity we ought to grab, but whether whether people will, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, people, the, the, the people who who seem to want to be proactive in preventing things like uh, like this happening are the people you don't want on your side, really. It's the, yeah. you know, it seems to attract the David Icke followers and, the, you know, the yeah. Tommy Robinson guys who are like, no, Britain, we stand up. And you're like, that's protest we have you have to learn that protest is not you standing and refusing and being defiant and but it seems that's the only people who are attracted to uh to, to taking stands yeah, you know is. which yeah. then you lose your whole point altogether so it's about engaging with people in that's what i think we need and we're not going to go off politically but i think we need like a completely different political party uh, someone who can rally people together and say we represent you but what you've got in mind, we don't need another guy, folks. We need to represent you, but in a, in a much better, more political way, which we don't have at the moment. So, yeah, it doesn't exist, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, you look at Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson, you think, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. And we we got the two extremes and nothing in the middle. The yes. two constantly. <laughs> um, so I think it, I'd be, it'd be absolutely ridiculous if we don't talk about your paraglide and every single paraglider pilot listening would be like, yeah, it was amazing. I love to hear about 
um, what he does. But what about the paragliding? So tell me a bit more about your paragliding history, mate. Where it started, how it developed, what you won. So um, I started out as uh, I started paragliding to get more of a hands-on feel for what the birds were doing. Um, so so in so I, I did a. I did an F1 paragliding course in, which was before, which was, was the, the beginners level course in, oh, when the hell was that? 1984. Does that count be right? No, it must have been later than that. About 19, yeah, in the in the 80, late eighties, up in Aberdeen over New Year because I didn't know what the hell I was doing and I thought that was a good time to go for a paragliding course. <laughs> And, and bizarrely, we had three days of perfect weather, and, and I got my ten soaring flights in, and got the license, and um, uh, yeah, and it was in the days when so we had, you know, Black Magics were the then competition wing, and um, used to walk up the hill. It was a it was a four hundred foot mountain, mountain, you know, four hundred foot hill. <laughs> walk up the hill, fly down, walk up, and I'd get. 10 flights in in a day and be completely shattered at the end and um, I absolutely loved it and then things got complicated with jobs and moving around and stuff and I ended up in Cambridge which has as you can imagine no hills no whatsoever hills. and it's yeah. quite hard to get flying and then kind of got back into it in the mid 90s and went learnt with the uh, Ian Curra's lot up in, um, up in the Dales and um Bought a wing from them, which they said perfectly, perfectly sensible. It turned out to be Rob Crookshank's PwC winning <laughs> um, <laughs> that Supra with the trimmer risers on it. That where, um, as you as you uh, pulled down on the speed system, it let up on the on the D's, and it just yeah, it was uh, it was great fun. And, <laughs> and then I spent a year in Sweden within. 15 minutes drive of a fantastic coastal soaring site and got 500 hours of coastal soaring in, which just kind of wow. got me going. Uh, came back to the UK, got into cross country flying, did a lot of a lot of cross country, and then started competing. And I did the European Championships at Garmisch as my first major international event with Russ Ogden and the team, and uh, Ulrich Jessup and Dave Snowden, and uh, yeah, that was that was um, entertaining. Um, absolutely fantastic event, really. Flying around Garmisch is amazing flying, proper big Alps, um, but it rains a lot, so you've got to be lucky with the weather. Uh, and then I flew with the British team on and off for about um, 10 years and uh, got together with Bruce Goldsmith to um, design paragliders with the airwave paragliders, as was then, and uh, design a whole series of competition wings and I, I won the nationals four times on those and Bruce won the world championships and um, and then uh, moved on to design Bruce moved to advance and did some design work for them as well and then um, moved to work with uh, Jim Jim Gliders doing concept, concept design work on Boomerang's uh, 789 uh, a little bit on Boom 10 Mainly, basically, sort of concept overall layout, aerofoil design, some of the internal structure work, none of the none of the detail work, but um, lots of the kind of you know, the aspect ratio should be this much, and the span, and the wing sweep, and, and the layout should be like this. And those one, there's the PwC and the World Championships, so they all they all work quite well. But most of that's down to Jean or or to Bruce and the paradigm the designers are. Yeah, very impressive people. Jin and both those two, both. So Jin in particular, I remember in in the World Championships in Sierra Nevada in Spain. I remember him flying the first day, and I was flying with him, and I was on uh, um, Boomerang Two at the time. He was on the same thing, and uh, we were flying about the same performance. And then I landed, watched him. Trimming four lines over here and two lines over there. The next day we flew together and completely destroyed me in on glide. I mean, absolutely, just he just done little tiny tweaks. Yeah. Um, you know, how did you know that you need to change that? And he said, "Well, you know, ten years of paradigm tuning." And yeah. And 
Bruce Goldsmith's the same, really. They just, you know, I've, I've been flying with him, and he said, oh, yeah, I think the tension's wrong in, this, in the sail here. Um, just hold this fold. So he'll take the bottom surface and fold it over like that. We'll get sticky tape out and sticky it up and say, yeah, that looks a little bit better. I'll go and try it. And then he's going out doing asymmetrics with it, held together with sticky tape, just to adjust. And, and they're just these, uh, you know, amazing what they do. It's very, it's a very artisan, you know, it's just all that sort of skill knowledge that you have to do an yeah. apprenticeship with a, with a person who's been doing it for years and you can learn how to do it. And it's, yeah, huge respect for those guys. They really know exactly what they're they they're, know exactly what changes what. They're probably um, doing things that you would find very hard to replicate if you use a computer program as well. So you would put all this stuff into a computer program. It would do all the, um, all the calculations and look at it mathematically. But until you fly the actual glider, just the feeling, the sensation that these guys have just through years of trial and error and tweaking here before computer programs were really available that would do what they were doing. The fact that they can do that in an age now where and they're probably better at it than the computer programs are you know but that was always that was always bruce's thing is he 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 always so bruce's gliders are always famous for the handling that they've got and he's got really good feel for you know making giving you the right amount that goes through the risers and the right amount that goes on the brakes and a bit of weight shift um, but Bruce, what Bruce wanted was he wanted to be able to, to sit on his, you know, use his glider plan design program, sit on the design program, design the wing. What he really wanted was to be able to send the design off and the prototype comes back and it flies right first time. Yeah. Which he never did. Never ever did. <laughs> the, best one had. Um, the best one of those, we, we launched it and the ground hand, you always ground handle them first. And we ground handle it and ground oh, The launch is fantastic on this. Right, let's go and have a fly. Uh, you go first, Bruce, because you designed it. And he went and flew it and had a trim speed of 50 kilometers an hour, which is why the launch Ooh. was great. So he just, oh. just got the, <laughs> just got the angle set up. You've got the, the pilot position too far forwards underneath the, yeah. underneath the wing. And you know, those sorts of things. And we, we, so for about five or six years, we'd be talking pretty much every day about a new design and what we've got to change. And I'd, I'd analyze the images and send back pictures of the wing. Yeah, there's a twist here, and there's a bit of a wrinkle there, and a curve, and you can see the tensions are all there. And after about five or ten years of that, interacting with Dave Aberdeen, who wrote the program, he got to a stage where instead of taking about ten or fifteen prototypes to get to a wind that was right, it would take about one. It would take about three, and sometimes the first one would fly as you want it. So, so they they fed that artisan knowledge into the computer program, so it kind of. Yeah, they, they, they join the dots, so, it, yeah. so you couldn't sit down and do it from scratch. Yeah, yeah. But you, uh, you couldn't write the program and get it right. But Bruce said that one of the really big things that really helped was when they went to the first CAD-based um, top surface panel design programs. It, you suddenly got a wing with far, far fewer wrinkles yeah. than you had before. Because uh, previously it was, it was like tailoring with a piece of chalk, you know, you cut it. Yeah. Curves by eye and stuff. And, yeah. yeah. And now, now like ozone and stuff are uh, using a lot of laser cutting, and lots of people have gone on to yeah. laser cutting. So the advancements are like millimeters of difference in cells can have an effect. Like that's the, uh, like aerod- I know, uh, listen, I know very little about aerodynamics, and I'm talking to a guy who knows a lot of aerodynamics, yeah. but if you've got a cell that's two millimeter wider than every other cell, that's not just two millimeters more of air, that's cubed, I guess. So yeah, yeah like that makes. makes huge yeah, huge. so the uh, one who the one who who impressed me was Hannes Papesh, who was Nova. Nova, yeah. Five. And and he was the first one who did a full um, fluid structure. Well, <laughs> it's my wife coming <laughs> through. <laughs> so, Hello. <laughs> yeah, he's the first one who did a full fluid structure. It worked out how much tension is in this line supporting this much cloth and that's when he did the mentor you know remember the mentor yeah. was a, a low b i think with a fantastic performance because it got so little line in it he, yeah. that was because of the way he modeled he, he'd written the computer program himself to do the fluid structure design optimize it not just for the aerodynamics but also for the loads it carries and that, yeah. that was a big step forward and i think most of them are now most of the manufacturers are doing that, at least to some extent. But I think Hannes has still got 
a reasonable lead on that one. It's a really yeah. difficult problem. Yeah, it's I mean, because you know the airfoil changes as the load changes, and yeah, the load changes as the airfoil changes. I mean, grow. this uh, the sport yeah. is uh viewed slightly to be quite hippie and there are a lot of paraglider pilots who are quite hippie they're laid back it's just the joy of the freedom the expression of freedom but at the same time the sport attracts some really intelligent people and the guys who are at the forefront of design they are some really switched on really intelligent yeah. people who are constantly looking for progression in a like russ was saying to me in his interview um like there's they pretty much reach the limit of all they can do with lines, as in thickness, materials and stuff. Yeah. So to be at, at a point now where you've got so much that you have to do with so little, which is obviously the aerofoil aspect, you know, that's massive. The, go from, I wasn't around late 80s, early 90s, but that's, in retrospect, that's two minutes ago. Two minutes ago, when you compare the wings then to how they are now, the advancement is uh, incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And... and the most impressive thing is that is all that performance has come with a big improvement in safety. Yeah. So when I was when I was flying in the late nineties, early early two thousands, the top end wings were really poisonous. Yeah. If it went wrong, it really went wrong. I've heard sto- I have heard some stories. Yeah, they uh, they do. So- like, I remember somebody was telling me about the um, the R ten. I think it was, um, and that's a modern glider in comparison to some of the older things. Um, but yeah, like the R ten sounds like that was a handful when it went wrong. Lovely until it went wrong, but when it went yeah. wrong, that was a handful, which is a modern version of the gliders that you're talking about, really. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that that was that was a revelation in its in terms of safety from what I was thinking. Of. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. So it's just it's been stepping up and up and up and up in terms of safety and it's really made a huge huge improvement and it's you know but, but the performance has plateaued i think i think russ is right that we have kind of got to a point where we're seeing we're in that marginal gains space now yeah. where you're getting little you're getting a bit of drag reduction in your harness actually makes a really big difference to your overall performance because the wings yeah. are all you know I mean, you just have to look at you know, the the um, <clears throat> the top competition wings, and they've all they've all plateaued out, and now the now the sort of top ENDs are beginning to come up to the same level as the top yeah. competition wings, and they're all just it's all it's all matching out to. And I can't see what changes actually. I mean, it used to be ten years ago, I you know, I could see there were, there was a massive amount to be gained, but now I can't see. It's not obvious to me where the big gains are going to come yeah. from. Yeah, no. I mean, I, and I guess that's looking from a scientist point of view, but from for myself, I look at, so I fly an Enzo, an Enzo 3, and I look and I said, like I said to Russ, for me, the best glider on the planet for cross-country flying is the Xeno, which is a step down from the Enzo 3. And that's simply because performance-wise is marginal, if you're not on full bar racing, performance wise is marginal. You've got a bit more inherent safety because it's not a comp glider, lower aspect ratio. That's the best wing to be on. One that gives you almost, almost as much um, performance for better safety. So even when you look at that, the, the, the little bits that you're tweaking out, they are so marginal. I mean, over, over a long task with no mistakes, of course, you're got the, the Enzo is going to pull away at every, in every aspect, but you're not talking like, 20 minutes in goal quicker you're talking yeah. marginal gains yeah yeah well I'm, and when I was on the um, when I was writing the CCC rules for CIBL um, I did the last iteration that's the last one I'm, hang on, I'm not doing it anymore yeah. um, and I was looking at um, whether we had to stick with the same speed bar travel or, or we could limit it or extend it and um Everybody was dead against extending it at all for safety reasons because the top speed ends up, you know, kinetic energy is what causes problems. Yeah. Uh, so I said, what, what about if we shorten it by, by you know, if we, at the moment we've got half mil, we've got a half centimetre of tolerance in there. What if we just get rid of that? And, they, and um, Torsten from Gin was absolutely adamant that we couldn't get rid of that five mils of tolerance because if we did, we'd lose measurable amount of top speed and they wouldn't be able to sell the the next round of wings because it wouldn't be quite as fast because of that five mils yeah. speed bump. and you think oh yeah now we really are in marginal gains on that but yeah. yeah Zeno Leopard yeah that that's where that 
I think there's there's I think those will catch up with the with the Enzos and Booms. I yeah. think I think that that difference is always is going to disappear. Really. Yeah, I'm intrigued by the leopard. It's uh, unfortunate that this this is like now is the leopard's time this this season. Yeah. The, yeah. Now, and it's unfortunate and also because Idris is a friend um, I've been interested to see it. Alex said I could take his for a spin and stuff so I've been really interested about the leopard but I, you know it's an unknown entity to me again at the moment Alex so, was raving about his after yeah. Brazil but then I don't know if he did he have a Zeno? Oh he did didn't he? Yeah he had yeah. a Zeno he, I mean Alex flies a Zeno like other people fly an Enzo as well Alex is yeah. you know he, he's such a good pilot and um, he really loves his leopard even in comparison with the Zeno so I think what what you've probably got is uh, the Xeno has been out for a few years, so you've got the Leopard is an improvement slightly on that technology. So yeah. and G- like Jin and uh, Ozone always seem to be slightly off each other's direction, which I find really cool. It's not really like a um, no one's copying the other; they're slightly off in a different direction. Like the Boom was obviously it's had its troubles and it collapses and it cascades a bit. The big the Boom Eleven, but it's faster and it flies differently than the Enzo than the end this is comparative to the Enzo 3 um the Enzo 3 had the long break travel which some people didn't like but you know so I love it that they're just off slightly off on slightly different um angles and they're both doing their own thing but from each other's gliders little things for, oh what how have they done that then and you can just little tweaks yeah. to yours it's a difference. I really love that, and I think so, it would be so boring if they all ended up the same. With it, it's good yeah. that there's differences in in philosophy behind the gliders, really. It's, um, yeah, yeah. Jin's always liked gliders that go really fast. That's always been his thing. Yeah, top end speed, and I mean, he always gets it. But then he might give up something somewhere else as well. Yeah. So, Yes, it is a an interesting point right now. Um, like the I'm really excited about the Enzo Four and the new boom. Whenever the new boom is going to be done, like these next gliders, because the Enzo Three was like the Enzo Three was so dominant. You know, it'd be interesting to see what the Enzo Four is. Isn't, isn't going to isn't going to happen, is it? I don't. Know. So the interesting yeah. thing there is that South Korea is fully open for business now, and uh, and France is closed. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> there could be a little the race the the head to head you've got the, the tortoise in the hare situation now haven't you? <laughs> so yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but the other thing is there are now lots of other CCC wing manufacturers yeah. coming in. Maybe somebody you know, may, it, it's it's quite easy to get locked into one way of thinking about it. And maybe there are other there are other solutions that might be better. I mean, maybe you know there's the um, the triple seven looks quite interesting. Yeah, bloody expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean I think the 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 thing is is when you're in competitive sport people look at what's winning and then yeah. you end up then with 80% of the the people flying are on the wing that's winning and then of course because you've only got 20% flying other things that's not winning because not as many points. So you've got to weigh up why why are the other wings not doing as well? Is it representation and numbers in the field? And so yeah, you have to look at uh, many different things. So it will be interesting though because a couple of years ago, no one was creating triple C wings. There was like two manufacturers, and now everyone's back on it. Even Nuviak have really started to to look back into it. So it is going to be interesting in the next couple of years for wing well, development. Think, um... We, we took a big gamble setting up CCC to, to see if we could get more manufacturers in because there's yeah. no way they were coming through DHV or, or EN certification. It just wasn't happening. So, it's, yeah. yeah, that was the whole idea was to make it relatively light touch but still require, you know, well, still require the manufacturers to do the certification to, to put their name behind the wing being safe enough for normal yeah. people to fly, So which is is the big change actually the manufacturers have to say look we are happy for this to be flown by human beings <laughs> primarily that's what they're going to be used for so yeah we do. and you had so you were instrumental in in from the beginning of the ccc thing were you yeah yeah so i was so i was really pissed off when when we had the open class thing from the piedra Hita worlds where, where open class was banned instantly without any thought about what's going to go on next mm-hmm. And so um, I was on the CIVL committee at the time, and I said, look, I'll, I'll take on writing this new rule. Um, and the idea 
was always over the years to try and get back to most of what we had with open class um, allowing development the wings allowing wings to be improved and, and allowing multiple manufacturers to compete at high end and and i think it's got back as far as you know, it's taken a long time to get back to where we were. It's 10 years now, so yeah, it's taken a long time to get back to what we had. But with the manufacturers taking a lot more responsibility for the safety of the wings, and previously they just used to you know, build a wing and hand it off to um, one of the testing bodies and say, there you go, go and test it, often without even, in some cases, without even doing any flights on it themselves. And that's, yeah, the manufacturers need to own it. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it should be their responsibility, and, and and it is now. They are they are taking it sort of reasonably seriously, I think, which is good. So hopefully that's in. I think you know I've handed that on now, and hopefully it's in decent enough hands at CIBL that, that it'll uh, keep going. So Torsten um, Siegel from Gin and Luke Armand from Ozone are the main guys running that that scheme now and I think if anybody knows what a CCC wing should be it's those two guys you know, they're from the main competition manufacturers the only game that has to be played is you know, they've got a sort of first mover advantage they're ahead with the CCC wings now so it's, I've all, there's always been an element of uh, trying to stop them from fixing the system to you know, they've always tried to keep other manufacturers out and that's, that's not good yeah, uh, that, that having the monopoly on it's certainly not good. But at the same time, I mean, the Triple C system now has produced fabulous wings, um, and racing is is obviously becoming a lot more exciting, which hopefully means you draw more people to the sport. It's all so closer, isn't it? It's all yeah. fair. It's all fairer. Yeah. So it's all closer, and that's what you want with racing, really. It's just you, you want to be able to go man on man with the other guy. Well, I'm, I've been a professional athlete my my whole life, and I it's like for me, it's. I, I want to win, but within the parameters of the rules. It's no, there's no way, there's no question for me about cheating. I'm happy to be the worst person on the day as I have been in my fights. If I know I've come in there and I'm prepared, the worst thing for me is making excuses or pointing fingers or, so I want to know that when I enter into something, you know, it's it's completely fair. And in the Brits last year, I had a, an incident with um, some convergence and, I got was being sucked up at eight meters a second. We hadn't had eight meters a second for the whole day. Just hit some weird convergence, spiraling down. And we had an altitude limit, and uh, I it's like I was talking to the guys and I said, "Listen, when I go there, I'm going to present my argument, and if it if it's if it doesn't fall within the parameters of being able to, I'm happy to lose the place. That's the way it goes because all I can do as a sportsman is say this is what happened. If it still breaches rules, I deserve to be out of the competition. That's how." You know that, and I think that's how competition has to be. You have a rule set, and you have to stick within it. Yeah, yeah, that's so. exactly right. You just need to be, you need to make the rule set so that it's something that everybody's comfortable to be. To, yeah. To, it just wants to be open enough that you can understand it. Yeah. Really. Yeah, I mean, course, there was the uh, with the triple seven incident last. It the was it triple seven had the incident with the glider at the um, super final. They no. That Enzo. <laughs> With ozone, yeah. O yeah, that's right, yeah. Enzo something or other. Enzo or gate or something, two, yeah. Two, yes. yeah. Enzo gate. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Was, uh, yeah. It's funny that Russell's glider was right on the limit of the... Uh, <laughs> all the good pilots had the really stretched training edges. Around. <laughs> Luke Armand knows exactly, exactly what he's doing. He's a super, super smart guy and he knew exactly what he'd done. Right? It's... That was, <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, the thing is as well, it's, what it shows is there's so many other people willing to step and se step up and say, hang on a minute, but like, let's boom. So it, it brings, it winds things back in. It gets, you know, I think if you, Lance Armstrong, it gets a really bad press, but done brilliant things for the sport because he was, okay, he was the most, the world's most famous cheat, but in an era when everyone was cheating. Now, what it allowed to do is it exposing Lance Armstrong stops. It, it cleans up the sport. The sport changes fundamentally because of what happened. Now, you can blame Lance Armstrong, but he was a massive cheat within a sport that was cheating. What he also did was, off the back of that, the sport's now a completely different sport. So you have to say that, you know, these errors have to be made 
and then once the errors are made, the, the sport can change and evolve off the back of them. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, are, are you still flying now, or are you you're a flying? Just... I, I've flown for a bit. I had a I broke my arm on a beach holiday, rock pooling. Oh. Bloody annoying. <laughs> the dangers <laughs> of rock pooling. Yeah, and it was um, it was in May, so I missed an entire season. I haven't. I've sort of. I haven't picked up the paraglider. I've flown once since then. That was two years ago. Um, but um, sitting watching the Swifts flying around at the moment, I'm thinking, God, I really. I mean, it is. It's a it's a different amount of freedom, isn't it? Yeah. I think there's nothing really quite like it. So I'm itching to get out there again. Yeah. As soon as we're allowed out. Yeah. I hear you, mate. That's why I don't paramotor because it's not paragliding. Like I don't paramotor, and I'm sure people like flying. I don't. I don't like flying. I like paragliding. I, you know, I, I want to be in competition with the elements, and I want to know I have to catch the thermal or I miss it. And that's what I love about that. That freedom that comes with it. Yeah, it's walking to the front of the hill, and off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I mean, I came to it quite late, um, but I, now that I've got it, I've just fell into it and I'm obsessed. So I am looking forward to getting back out and maybe we'll get out together. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, mate, listen, thank you very much for joining me. I, I want to speak to you again at some point because I want to have a look. I want to keep it more about the aerodynamics of birds and I'm obsessed with like the, the way that ravens do aerobatics and other corvids don't and all this sort of stuff and we can talk about all those elements of flight that we haven't covered here but this had to be sort of an introduction to you from people for people and I feel like it's been brilliant for that mate also for myself getting to know you so honestly thank you very much for joining me what do you want what do you want to do the one so you're very welcome and let's do it again yeah. and uh, when you want to do one about raven aerobatics I've got films of them doing a full 360 degree roll I can let you have some. oh wow yeah Go. definitely <laughs> definitely we'll definitely I'll definitely receive them and watch them 100% um, we'll get that penciled in mate I'll get this one put out in the next couple yeah. of months we'll definitely get one back in and get that done um, yeah good luck podcast i've enjoyed it thank you mate is there any um do you want to give any shout outs you want to make any announcements do you want people to follow you or your work or anything like that or no i'm good thanks okay mate lovely job well listen thank you very much and i will um see you again in a couple of months thank you very much adrian cheers